Hey, well, good morning, everybody. My name is Howard Olson. I'm here in Vancouver, I guess about uh, maybe maybe within 10 miles of where Sean is today. So I'm just on the other side of the river. She's on the other side of the river. I'm on the other side of the river. And uh, anyway, it's really great to be here this morning. I made, a, I made a presentation earlier in the week and Sean called me up. Hey, could you come and do this for our group? So listen, I, I want to I get into the content here. I want to give you as much value as I can in the time that we've been allotted. But I want to start with this. Listen, the most essential the most essential skill that any solopreneur, business person, coach, mentor, teacher, corporate sales professional can have is sales and communication skills. It is the most vital thing because sales really does solve everything. But most people I've come to learn have a misconception around what selling is. So what I want to do this morning, I'm going to, I'm going to, can I, do I have uh, permission to do a screen share here? I'm going to, Basically, can you see that screen? Oh, wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Screen share, click the green button and share. And there we go. Awesome. All right, can you guys all see that? We can. All right. Listen, and just a, a learning point, I'm sure, I, I understand that many of your coaches, and you'll understand this, you know, there is a high likelihood of retention when you can combine an auditory message and a visual message together. So that's why I like to use slides, big graphic slides, because it just reinforces the point. So this morning, I really want to talk about getting back to basis because saw, sales really does solve everything. But as I said a few moments ago, most of us have just a terrible misconception about what selling is. Uh, I've been working with entrepreneurs and small businesses for the better part of the last 20 years. And I just realized that a lot of people have an anxiety and even an apprehension around it because they just don't understand what this thing is. But at the end of the day, listen, if you don't have sales, if you don't have revenue, you don't have a business and you're not feeding yourself. And so it's vital that we get our heads wrapped around this. So let's just dive into this. And when we get into the Q and A, you can ask me about my background and where all this came from, all right? So I want you to finish this session. We've all heard, heard this, right? When the going gets tough, and you're all thinking the tough get going. No, when the going gets tough, the tough innovate, the tough pivot, the tough find new ways to come in. And listen, we're in a very, you know, kind of strange market condition right now. But I would tell you, do you know that six of the, actually 30 of the Dow Industrial Index started during depressions or recessions. Right now is the time to really ramp up your sales skills. And we were on a call just a few moments ago. One of the pieces of advice that I gave, listen, cut back on everything else, but now is the time to really engage with your potential market because customers that you may have never had access to, their loyalties are loose, their attention is up because everybody's struggling. Everybody's looking for a way to get ahead now. So now is really the time to start engaging in conversations. So we got we to gotta get back to a sales attitude, a sales mentality, because you know we've also heard this expression, nothing happens until something gets sold. And it's absolutely true. I mean, until, until your idea has been accepted by another human being, it, this, is, this is the most vital activity because you know, it's sales and revenue that feed, that it feeds our, our mission, our vision, it, our, our passions, but it also feeds our very livelihoods. But, you know, it, the, the challenge is that most of us have, you know, like I said, an apprehension and a misconception around what selling is. And the most important thing I want you to get here is that we are all in sales, every single one of us. But if we poorly define it, we don't even understand what that is. Every single day. You know, we are communicating ideas to our kids, to our colleagues, to our customers. So whether you're a mother trying to get your kids to, to bed on time, or maybe, you know, you're, you're, a, you're a father and you're trying to get an agreement on the family where your next family vacation is going to be, you know, we're selling constantly to our kids, to our colleagues, just as much as we're selling to our potential customers. When you define it this way, selling is really just about expressing your ideas from another human being's point of view but it's impossible to do that if you don't know what that point of view is first. And so, you know, we've all got an agenda. So our kids, like, I want to stay up late. And you're like, no, I want you to go to bed. I want you to do your homework. Or you might be, you know, talking to a colleague in the office. You know, I listen, I've, I want, I've, got a, I've got a better way of, you know, doing our accounting. I've got a better way of doing our marketing plans. I want, so we're all walking around with these, with these I want agendas. Your life is one constant negotiation. And selling, yes, when we think about it, there's revenue attached to it. That's the business application. But when we define selling as really just expressing your ideas from somebody else's perspective, what we're really talking about here is where you're transmitting an idea and it is successfully and positively received. I think it's important that we understand that. 
right? And that takes a lot of the pressure off us. So I want to give you a couple practical definitions before I really jump into the meat, because my goal is to leave you with a couple of nuggets that for sure you're going to be able to use by the time this call is finished. As soon as this is over, you'll be able to put this into practice. Now I've got a, uh, just, I need to adjust uh, where it, where the camera looks here. There we go. Now I can see everything. So, you know, many of you on this call will know John Maxwell, at least know who he is. Like this guy has written over 50 books on the subject of leadership. Uh, I'm also a conference speaker. I, uh, I spoke, he and John and I were at the same conference a number of years ago and we were milling around backstage and I just kind of with a grin on my face said, Hey, John, you know, listen, you've written like 50 books on the subject of leadership. And he goes, yeah, I have. And I said, man, that's a lot of words. If you could get this whole notion of leadership down to a single sentence, what would it be? And without skipping a beat, he just grinned and he said, it's simple. Uh, leadership is nothing more than positive influence with people. And I thought, so, you know, that's, that's incredible because for the last 30 years, I've been saying that selling really is nothing more than positive influence with people. So if leadership is positive influence with people and selling is positive influence with people, selling and leadership in my world, they're synonymous. They go hand in hand. And when I talk about positive influence with people, I'm not talking about the, the influence that we impose. I'm talking about the influence that they grant to us. Now, you may want to have more, and I think everybody on this call would, would like to have more influence with more people. The question is, the operative question is, will they grant it to you? And when you know what you're doing and you know how to communicate from their perspective, they will. So that's definition number one. Definition number two is that selling really is nothing more than just a good conversation. It's a conversation with results. That's it. Okay. So just simplify the way that you think about this. And all of a sudden your activity gets a whole lot easier. So I'm going to quote myself this morning. You know, listen, our technologies have changed. Uh, Twitter has changed, Facebook has changed, our attention spans have changed, but listen, nothing outside of that when it comes to selling and influence and all the rest of these things, nothing's really changed. I mean, the fundamentals of human con connection and trust are the same today as they were 2,000 years ago, and they're the same as they will be 1,000 years from now. We have been wired, okay? Listen, we're all, we are wired to keep ourselves safe and protected. And, you know, that's really what our brain is doing, monitoring and scanning the environment, trying to keep itself safe. And so the, the fundamentals of human connection and building trust, nothing has changed. Just the vehicles and the modes of communication that we use. That's the only thing that's gone. And if you want to be successful in your business, you've just got to get back to basics. And that's what I want to help you with this morning. You know, there's an expression that says out of the mouths of babes. We've all heard that expression out of the mouths of babes. What does it mean? From my, from my perspective, here's what that means. You know, children have this incredible capacity to look at something and take the complex and just state it in utterly simple terms. They take complicated things and simplify them. And then we grow up and we become adults and we have this incredible ability to take the simple and make it utterly complex. Okay. We need to get back to basics and simplify things if you want to have a shot at successfulness here. All right. So, listen, without getting into my whole background, I've run global sales teams. I lived in Hong Kong for a bunch of years. I've lived, I've lived in five different countries on five different continents. And I'm not talking like three months at a time. I'm talking solid periods of time. And I've done everything from small account sales, right up to global multinational kind of team building exercises. For the last 20 years, I have been a solopreneur myself, working with small business people, because I've just seen way too many people needlessly struggle around this issue of sales. Because listen, this is the stuff that you're not going to get in grade school, high school, or even in business school. We got to get back to this. And so it's, it's really been a lifelong passion of mine to, to teach this stuff that you don't get in school so that people can go out and quit struggling around this whole area of revenue generation. Now, I've just discovered over the years, I've worked in, you know, whether it's been in Mongolia or China or in Japan or right here in Vancouver or down in Miami or in Los Angeles or Chicago, there are three universal truths to selling anything, anywhere, to anyone on this planet that transcends cultural, national, or gender boundaries. It has nothing to do with it. In fact, it has very little to do with your product or service. It's all about you and how you're being perceived by your potential customer. The power of perception has such incredible ramification. We need to understand what that is. So three universal truths. Here they are. Truth number one, 75% of the outcome of any selling. And again, like, let me go back to this. In my world, selling, leading, 
influencing, communicating, they're all synonymous terms. So if you've got to hang up around this word selling, I'll use it frequently. You can just sub in the word communicating. You can sub in the word influencing, okay? 75% of the outcome of any selling, communicating, or influencing opportunity is directly related to the manner in which you establish trust, rapport, and relevance. Big words, trust and relevance in the initial stages of your conversation or engagement with them. So let me think about this. Three quarters of whether you win or lose happens in the beginning when you're opening, not in the end when you're closing. And we've always heard this mantra, always be closing, always be closing. And I just say that's nonsense because listen, when you learn how to open, closing will take care of itself. You cannot close a sale before you open it. When you learn how to open, closing becomes an effortless thing. Okay, so we're gonna talk about that this morning. Truth number two, every single human being on this planet will make exactly five critical decisions in a precise psychological order before you can sell, convince, or persuade them of anything. Now, I'm, I'm using some specific words here, and I'm doing it with great intention. Five, not four decisions, not three decisions, not six, it's five decisions. And I even run the dating course in our church. And it's the same five decisions. We just need to change the language and the context. Five decisions, because it's all about you, okay? In what kind of order? In a precise order, not random order, not sometimes I do it. And the whole point of everything that I do is because, listen, the, the difference between, between intuition is when your intuition is working, things seamlessly flow. But when your intuition is off, all of a sudden we begin, you know, struggling a little bit. Precise. This is all about, I want you to take this down, take notes, write this down. Because once you get intentional about it, you can harness it repeatedly. Every human being on this planet will make exactly five critical decisions in a precise, not random psychological order. Here they are. If you're selling and I'm buying, if you're selling or customer is deciding about you, here's the first thing they're thinking. The first decision is all about you. They're thinking, do I like you or do I trust you? Are you here for my reasons or for your reasons? Are you trying to sell me? Or are you genuinely trying to help me? How many times have you met somebody and in the first, you know, 13 seconds at a subconscious level, you go, looks good, sounds good, but something's not right. I don't know. There's just something intent intrinsically. I don't trust this. You do it. Don't I do it. the Bible, you know? Pardon me? <laughs> anyway, all, all of your customers are instinctively doing this. We have been wired by God to scan the environment to keep ourselves safe. So the first decision is all about you. Do I like you? Do I trust you? Are you here to help me? Or are you just trying to sell me? Second decision. Okay, I like and trust you. Who are you? Who is your company? What is your reputation? And even if you're a solopreneur, you and your company are separate entities and you need to talk about your company in the third person. For all intents and purposes, High Output Training Systems is a small business. I mean, I've got an assistant, I've got an accountant, but you know, I'm the intellectual property. I create all the training material. I do all the keynote speeches. So I am the company, but when I talk about it, I talk about, how, I talk about me and my experience from the I perspective and when I talk about what we as a company can do for you, I talk about it in the we perspective. There's just comfort and safety in this. Here's what your customer's thinking right now. Who are you guys? What's your reputation? And what, you, what is the market and your customers saying about you? 99% of most business people in the market today, even trained professionals, spend no time talking about the credibility and the validity of the companies they represent. They think that because they're representing the product, that's, no, it's you, your company. Third decision in exactly this order is about your product or service. Okay, so here's what they're thinking now. Okay, I like and trust you. I like you. Yeah, I can trust your company. How does what you have or how does what you offer fix my problem? satisfy some kind of need, want, or desire, or somehow make my life easier. And it could be any one of those decisions or it could be a combination. So how does what you have fixed my problem and make my life easier? They may be thinking this. And here's the problem and here's where 99% of sales conversations go off the rails and this is where they fail. This is why most people are losing at least 35 to 40% of the sales they could have and should have had. Because we walk into a meeting, we shake hands, we get through all, you know, whether it's on Zoom or when we go back to face to face, you know, we exchange pleasantries and all the rest of this. But eventually, so how, how do you think you can help me? Or what do you think you can do for me? And this usually happens in the beginning of the conversation. And because they've asked us this question, we feel compelled now that we have to answer it. Oh, and we do. So we make this great present. Well, here's what we do. And here's how we do. It, and here's how I think I can help you. But listen, if selling is about expressing your ideas from their perspective, 
And if it's about fixing their problems, if you're making this presentation, on the front end of your engagement with them, you've totally bypassed building any trust in you. You've completely bypassed building any trust in your company. And right now you're addressing a need and want that you don't even understand because you haven't engaged them in conversation yet to understand their perspective. And you run the risk now of being completely irrelevant. It may be a brilliant presentation. How many times have you had a meeting where you, you, know, you talked about what you can do for them and you both nod in your head and you felt like it was a great call? And then all of a sudden, the, there's no follow-up, the phone doesn't ring, and the customer that you thought you should have had, you don't have. Why? Because you made a presentation around a need, want, or desire you didn't understand, and they themselves never felt understood. You want to get really good at selling, get really good at the consultative front end of this. Every human being on this planet, including you, me, and every one of your potential customers, wants to be profoundly heard and profoundly understood. And they will not fully trust you until they feel understood by you. Okay, I just, I can't get any more clear about it than that. All right, so this is really about getting into this consultative kind of mindset where they feel heard. I, I once heard it put this way, to be loved is wonderful, to be understood is profound. Just hang on to that, okay? Fourth decision, exactly the sort is about your price. People do not buy price, they buy value. And in my learned experience, there are three ways, three fundamental ways to create value. An unshakable value proposition. One, they see value in a relationship with you because they feel heard, they feel understood, they understand that you understand them, and their trust in you has skyrocketed. Two, they see value in a relationship with your organization because your reputation is stellar and they trust it. And third, they see value in what you're offering because they now understand you've made a presentation that shows how you can take what you have to specifically address their need, their want, their desire, or, or whatever that need that they put in front of you. But you cannot do that if you haven't engaged them in meaningful conversation first. And when you can do these three things, when you can create an unshakable value proposition, all the most current research shows us that the marketplace will pay between five and 9% more to receive the value they perceive that they can get from you. People are not looking for sales reps. They're, not, 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 they're looking for strategic business partners that can help them be more productive, whether on the corporate side or even on the small business side. All right, so they don't buy price, they buy value. And you are the biggest portion of that value proposition. The fact that you do what they need is merely a qualifier to have the conversation. They, people, remember this, don't forget this. People buy products and services through and from people they know, like, and trust. Okay, you're it. You're the sale, and I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Last decision is all about time, and here's what they're thinking right now, okay? Is this the right time for me to be doing this? Like, I've got a couple decisions pending right now that uh, because I'm in the middle of a project, I'm, I'm rescaling my business. Because of what's gone on over the last couple of months, I'm also in the middle of a major pivot. My, my marketplace has been the corporate marketplace, speaking at conferences all over the world. Well, I can tell you something. In my business, as a, as a conference speaker, as a workshop facilitator for corporate entities, you know, I'm really busy from about the end of March up until the middle of June, then summer hits, and then from September, end of August, September, up until about the end of October, maybe the first couple of weeks in November. And then everything shuts down from November through December and starts ramping up for February's finished and starts ramping up the end of March. Well, COVID hit. So listen, I, I, my revenue comes to a dead standstill every year in November and it doesn't really kick up. And it's been this way for 20 years. And so you know, you know how to prepare for that. And then it starts kicking up again in March. Well, I'll tell you what, COVID hit and every booking I had on the year instantly canceled. So I haven't, you know, I hadn't brought any revenue in since November and all of a sudden everything that I had scheduled canceled. Well, okay, what are we going to do with this? Am I going to, am I going to cry in my Wheaties or am I going to figure out how to pivot this thing? So I started contacting these corporate entities. I said, listen, I'm, I'm virtual ready. We can do this virtually online. Maybe not a good conference speak, but your people need training. Your people need facilitation. Let me do this for you. So I've been beta testing this and now I'm shifting my entire focus to the small business community and I'm opening this thing called the High Output Sales Academy. So I've got some vendors that I've been talking to that I've been looking to launch some initiatives and now they're pushing me to close the sale. But it's the wrong time because I, my priority has shifted. I am so focused now on getting this, this leadership academy, this online learning platform launched that all those other decisions have to be pushed to the back corner. What's the point of this? Okay, I'm in control of time. 
And the same thing is true for your customers. Customers buy when they're good and ready. And so when we, we so we keep hearing these, you know, these, these, these sales mantras and I just, it makes me sick to my stomach. Always be closing, try, give them the trial close. Give them the, would you forget about it? When you learn how to open a sale, get to a place of deep and profound understanding where not only do you understand them, but they understand that you understand them. You build a level of unshakable trust and they will buy from you when they are good and ready. And that's the whole piece here. When you know how to sell, you don't need to sell because customers are looking for exceptional buying experiences and they will come and purchase from you because they implicitly trust you and they see how you can help them. So forget about this always be closing. All right. Now we do teach a guaranteed pressure free close. We give you a nice, easy, soft, you know, tender question where they'll naturally commit provided you, they, they trust you, trust your company, trust your product. So people say, would you teach us the guaranteed close? Not if I didn't teach you how to open first. Otherwise, I'm going to teach you how to kill yourself because if you don't know how to open, you still can't close no matter how I teach this to you. So that's decision number two, five decisions, precise order. Third decision, third truth, 62% of the time, even trained professionals don't ask for whatever the next appropriate commitment is. So sometimes closing the sale isn't closing the sale. You need to understand what your objective for the meeting is. You know, so you have to ask. Maybe, maybe my objective is, okay, listen, we had a great discovery session here. Let me put together some thoughts, draft them up. Let's get together next Tuesday and talk about the ideas that I've got. Maybe that what you're closing on is just the secondary follow-up meeting. And sometimes we just don't get the follow-up meeting because we didn't ask for it. So we leave that low hanging fruit sitting on the tree. So if all of this is true, if, if my foundational premise here, and I've taught tens of thousands of people this who are now off prospering to success, right? If those three things are true, those three truths are true and these five decisions are always at play, here's what we do. We take these five decisions and we basically map out what we call the sales blueprint, a sequence decision process where we can have a natural and organic conversation that rotates around these five decisions so that you can have a more meaningful structured conversation. The conversation will always be organic. I mean, I can't get, if they say this, you say, forget it. That's scripted nonsense. Conversations by their nature are organic. But when you have a framework within which to work, you know how to steer and direct that conversation in a very natural and organic fashion. And that's really what we specialize in. That's, I've been doing this for 20 years now. So what I want to do from here is I just, in the time that I've got, and I, what time is it? I've got about, yeah, I've got a few minutes that I can continue to play with you. I just want to leave you a couple high level ideas. All right. So I want to really focus on this whole issue of value and helping you create this path to value. All right, three things I want you to remember. We all want to be heard and understood. Every, I do, you do, and all your customers do. Customers buy outcomes, and at the end of the day, you are the sale because they're going to be buying from you, through you, because of you. All right? So, principle number one, think outcome. Think outcome, think outcome. In other words, think cause and effect. My question to you is, what are you really selling? So let me use you, me as myself as an example, and I'll give you a couple generic examples. Okay, so I am in the speaking business, I'm in the training business, and if I walk up, but I can promise you, in the last 20 years, nobody ever hired me because they wanted a speech. Nobody ever hired me because they wanted a training program. What do they want? So I, my specialty happens to be communication sales and leadership principles. Why did they hire me? Well, they hired me because they either wanted to, they, they had a sales problem and they wanted to increase their revenue results or they wanted to increase the effectiveness and the efficiency of their team. Or maybe they had an employee morale issue and they needed somebody that was inspirational and motivational to come and give that to them. So at the end of the day, they didn't want training. What they wanted was improved sales results and improved morale. Training was just the thing that I used to deliver it to them. So you got to talk in terms of outcomes. So my question is, what are you really selling? Speak in terms of the outcome that you deliver. Like I can use this example, graphic designer. I'm a graphic designer. Nobody wants graphic design. What do they want? They want to sell their brand and they want to make their advertising more effective through, you know, imagery. So we speak in terms of the outcomes that you deliver. But how can we do that if we don't know what outcome they're after as expressed by them? So I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you a quick example and we're going to have a little fun. All right. So this is, uh, I've, I've made this up, but it illustrates the point beautifully. All right. Now, everybody on this call probably either owns a drill or at some point in time has used one. So here's a picture of a woman. She's got a drill in her hand. So what do you do with a drill? Okay. So you can't really respond. So I'm just going to take you through this. So in this inner hand, this lady's got a drill. So what do you do with a drill? Well, with a drill, you make, you make a hole, don't you? So did she want the drill or did she want the hole? Well, she wanted the hole. 
Well, but we can look, we can, we can take a lot of information from this picture. What is she doing with that drill and with that hole? She's putting up a shelf. So the question is, did she want the drill? Did she want the hole or did she want the shelf? Well, I guess she wanted the shelf. But now we can drill into this again, pardon the pun. Let's just drill in a, di hey, hey, Samantha, why are you putting up that shelf? Why do you want a shelf? Well, listen, I've got three kids and, you know, two of them, one is two years old and the other one is four. And man, these, little, these kids are into everything. And, the, you know, I've had the, you know, the laundry room, I've had the, the detergents down on the floor for a long time. And now these kids are into everything. I just need to create a neat, clean, safe environment for my kids. So did she want the drill? No. Did she want the hole? No. Did she want the shelf? Not really. What did she want? You got to get down to the essence of the outcome she's after. She wanted a neat, clean, safe environment for her kids, but she required a drill to produce that for her. Now, let's take another example. So over here, we got a guy. Okay, what's he got in his hand? He's got a drill. And with that drill, he's making a hole. And with that hole, he's hanging a shelf. So the shelf might look different, but for all intents and purposes, he's doing the same thing. But let's ask him now, why, why do you want this shelf? And we're just gonna have a little fun with this, okay? Forget about the gender and forget about the, I'm just having, I'm just having a joke here. So why are you putting up that shelf? And he says, because I wanna go golfing. What? Listen, my wife has been on me for the last year. It's been on the honey-do list. And she basically said, okay, listen, I've been asking to get that shelf up for over a year. Listen, no golf for you. You can't go play with your buddies until that shelf goes up. So did he want a drill? No. Did he want a hole? Not really. Did he care about the shelf? No. What did he want? He basically wanted to get this task done so he could get back out doing the thing that he wanted to do. So here we have two people doing almost exactly the same activity, having purchased exactly the same product, but two entirely different reasons for the purchase. Okay? What about this one down here? You think they want a hole? What do they want? They want the pain to go away. And the purpose of this illustration is to have you think about this. You can have 10, 20, 100 different clients all having purchased from you exactly the same thing. But if you engage them in deep and meaningful conversation, you will have discovered there will be some slightly different variation of the reason as to why they bought it. They were all looking for some different version of their outcome. And if you want to have more meaningful conversations that convert conversation into sales and revenue, you better start to understand what outcome they're after because then you can take everything you know about what you do and start dovetailing it. This is how I think I can help. You said you were looking for, you know, improved communication result. Here's how I think I can help you with that. Listen, they need to express from their perspective what it is they're after so that you can then acknowledge that you understand that and show them. Now you can take everything that you've got and make a meaningful, more relevant presentation and trust starts going through the roof. So did they want the drill or the hole? The answer is neither. None of them wanted a drill or a hole. And the same is true with what you do. With me, they don't want training and they don't want a speech. They want shifted perspective. They want increased results. They want better morale. I have to talk about those outcomes. Not the thing that I do, but the thing that they get when I do it. Okay? So what do you want your customers? So what, what value do you bring to your customers? This is the question at the end of the day. What happens when they buy? And I just want you to think about this question as you start thinking about how to position yourself. And if, if, you, if you need to retweak how you introduce yourself, talk in terms of outcome and the value that a typical customer gets. Don't talk about the thing that you do. Talk about the thing that they get. And all of a sudden that becomes a magnetic and attracting force to bring you the kind of people that you should be doing business with because they go, Oh, I want that. I don't want a coach. I want a result. All right. So, Part number two of this is, so I, we, we've developed this methodology which rotates around these five decisions. This methodology is based on two high-level principles. Principle number one, part of, and listen, the word method. Method, method, method. It's not random. There's a method to this. Part one of our method is the ability to come in and engage in conversation and ask meaningful thought-provoking questions that cause your customer to think about things in a brand new way. Okay, it's the questions that you ask, not the presentation that you make, that actually starts to engender this trust. And so, let me give you, let me just give you a, a very quick example of this. So, when I was, I was living in Hong Kong, I was global account director for this little company that was doing about $40 billion a year in, in, in revenue. Okay, so, I had about 1,700 salespeople reporting to me and through me. They were taking care of the daily accounts, and I was charged with going after global multinationals, specifically in the high-tech sector. I was working with 
Boeing and Dell and AMD and Intel and my, you know, I could go on. It doesn't matter. But one of the customers we wanted was Hewlett Packard. Hewlett Packard's, and I was, it was in the transportation business. I was in the air freight, sea freight, warehousing, distribution, customs, brokerage. And uh, so I was charged with going after Hewlett Packard. Their, their, their annual corporate freight budget is $150 million, all right, per year. You got manufacturing facilities all over the world, logistics, you know, supply chain management, all the rest of this. So we had never done any business with these guys. They worked on RFQs and RFPs, three-year contract kind of things. And uh, so I was charged going after it. We know how this works, that the first round of building trust with these guys is just to get invited to their next RFQ. Okay, then you bid and you tender to build a reputation with them. You're probably not going to win anything on the first round. That the next contract will run three years. And three years from now, you'll be invited again for the next three-year bid. You go through two or three of these things, and eventually you rotate in and become a supplier to them. So they we understood this was going to be a 10-year sales cycle. So anyway, I spent the first three years just traveling around the globe, meeting with all the VPs of distribution in Europe and North America, all over Asia, and just building solid relationship. One day this tender request hits the desk. That was a happy day in our office because we didn't even think we were going to get invited. I was invited to this thing and a 400 page document. So I read through it and I, so I basically picked up the phone and the guy that was coordinating was down in Singapore. His name was Sing Tam. And uh, so I picked up the phone and I, and I know that we're not the only ones who just received that. So I've got six valiant competitors that have all just received the same tender. We're all going to give them the same pricing. We've all got the same kind of financial fortitude and logistical capacities. So what is the core differentiating factor? I know something my competitors don't. It's going to be me and the absolute trust that I build with this guy where he feels profoundly understood. So I picked up the phone and I said, listen, we, we just picked up, we just got your RFQ and I, we're going to endeavor to give you the best response you've ever had. I really want to make this highly relevant, but I can't do that without asking you a couple of clarifying questions first. Would that be all right? He said, sure. So I said, listen, I'd like to do this in person. May I come down and see you? Now in this day and age of COVID and everything else, like where I'm spending a lot of time on webcam, we make this as personal as possible. When we get back to the time, we can get face-to-face. -face. This principle works virtually. This principle works face-to-face, -face, okay? So suspend any disbelief around this. So I went down and I see him. We, of course, we shook hands and we had a little chat and he says, well, what can I do for you? Or what can you do for me? And I said, well, Mr. Tam, it's, re it's really not so much about, you know, what you can do for us. It's what we really want to do for you. Now, I've been through your entire RFQ. You know, there's 400 pages here. There's a lot of questions. You've obviously put a lot of thought into this. I've only got one question. He, he says, you came all the way down here with one question. I said, it's just one question. He said, well, what is it? I said, in all the thought that you've put into this RFQ, what is the one question you couldn't figure out how to put in words that you wish was in there? And it was like dead silence. He thought about it. it. It seemed like an eternity. It was probably about 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. And he smiled. And he says, he says, that's a great question. He says, listen, and he told me a story. Now, because, it, because I come back, I, invite me back and I'll tell you the rest of this story. Bottom line, he told me a story about how their cargo was constantly getting bumped during Christmas. Okay. Cause here's how, here's what happens in manufacturing. Sean, by the way, how much time have I got? Can you just, can you just help me understand how much time I got here? Cause that'll, Determine how sure, many stories. Take another tell. 10 minutes and then you can answer questions, my friend. All right. I got 10 minutes. Okay. So let me tell the story and then we'll, we can do story. this. I have I time for the story now. All right. So I'm sitting there. So he basically says, he, say, he basically says, he says, great question. All right. He says, let, he says, let me tell you the thing. He says, every year, he says, as you know, 70% of all sales happen during the peak Christmas selling season in Europe and North America. He says, that's when Levi sells 70% of his jeans. That's when Mattel sells 70% of its toys. That's when we sell 70% of our computers. The difference between their Levi's, their toys, and our computers, he said, listen, the problem is at the speed at which Intel and AMD are changing the chip technologies, if we build a computer today and don't have it in market and sold within a month, we basically lose half the inventory carrying cost on outdated technology because the next round of technology has already been released. And here's the problem. Just because 70% of sales happens during Christmas, okay, logistics operations are going on. There's only so many airplanes that are flying out of Asia into North America into distribution centers. There's only so many ships. So every year between September and December, the volume of shipments expands 70%, but the volume of capacity doesn't expand at the same rate, which means that every year, every week during this period of time, we've got pallets being left behind on the docks getting bumped and everybody goes through rotations on bumps. The problem is when our cargo gets bumped, by the time it gets uplifted into market, the next round of chips is out and we're losing hundreds of millions of dollars every single month on inventory that's stale data because it didn't move on time. 
So I just, I smiled and I looked at him and I said, so Mr. Tam, if I understand you correctly, now listen to my language. Mr. Tam, if I, I've been listening to you. If I understand you correctly, you're looking for a logistics provider that has the financial fortitude and the logistics capacity to handle your normal volume of shipments, but you want somebody that's got enough bench strength with the carriers to ensure that it's never your cargo that's getting bumped. Is that correct? Basically, what he was saying is, I want you to bump somebody else's cargo in favor of mine, but he couldn't ethically or legally ask that in a tender. So I had to read between the lines. And I said, Mr. Tam, I said, so I, so I said, so you're looking for somebody who's got the bench strength to carry this off and to ensure we got, you know, uh, relationship with the carriers so that your cargo is not getting bumped. Is that correct? And he looked at me and said, Howard, I think you got it. Basically what he's saying, you got it. I went, I flew back, I flew back into Hong Kong, a couple of weeks went by. I got a call two weeks later. He said, Howard, I want to let you know, uh, we're not giving you the whole thing, but we've just given you a third of our logistics. That question and that answer was worth $50 million in one cut and that contract is still running today. That's the power of a thought provoking question and determining an outcome that you may not know if you didn't take time. So there's two parts to this, asking the thought provoking question, then shutting up and listening because they're going to drop clues all over you. I'm going to give you another example. So I said, there's two parts to this process, to this method. Part one is asking the thought provoking question that causes them to think in a new way, because if you'll ask, they'll actually tell you everything you need to know to be successful with them. If you don't, but the question you never ask is never going to get an answer. Part two is you ask these thought provoking questions, but then within that you need to sift through it, which means you really have to get really well trained, train yourself in the art of active listening because they're going to, they're going to drop answers on you. So I'll give you another example. So I got a big client here in Vancouver. They're called, um, MTI Community College. They've got six campuses. They're one of the biggest in early childhood education programs, uh, nursing programs. They do all kinds of things. But we've got lots of private community colleges in that space. And I got a call from this guy, from the CEO, the founder of, the, of, of, of MTI, big, big college here in, in town. He says, listen, we're looking for sales training. So my first question to him, this is over the phone. I said, sales training. I mean, you, you guys, and I, I knew what he wanted, but I, ne he, I needed him to understand that he, I understood what he was saying. So I engaged him in some questioning. So what, what's inspired you to consider sales training? He said, listen, we call our sales guys, we call them admission reps, but really what they're doing is screening students and selling programs to them. It's a sales job. I said, yeah, I think I, listen, let's, why don't we get together, have a quick chat and see if I, if I might be the right fit. Now I knew I could help him, but I'm taking really non-threatening language. Let me, let me make sure I'm the right fit for you. He's okay, come on. So we had a little chat. So I said, okay. So I asked him, you know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? What are you really good at? What do you want to accentuate? What do you, what, you know, what are some of the best attributes of your people? What are some of the greatest weaknesses? And he, so he answered all that. And of course we started painting a picture about how I could potentially help him and their, and their college. And then I asked him one more question. And the question was this, okay, if we decide to work together, listen, I'm setting it up as a hypothetical, so there's nothing threatening about this question. That he's not, I'm not asking him to make a commitment at this point. I'm saying, if we decide to work together, what is the one thing that must happen as a result of our time together that's non-negotiable your, from your perspective, that must absolutely categorically happen if we work together? He thought about it for a second. He says, I want more than the Hawthorne effect. I'll never forget this. I want more than the Hawthorne effect. Now, I didn't know what that was. And your customers are saying things to you all the time that you maybe don't understand what it is, but you better dig in and figure it out because they've just given you a clue. They've just given you a key. So I said, okay. I said, can you tell me what the Hawthorne effect is? He, he smiled. He says, he says, look it up. So I, we, we parted the company and we both agreed that there was probably a pretty good fit. So I went home and I Googled Hawthorne effect and I discovered that it was a study done by, uh, by business and social psychologists about how to increase productivity inside factories. And that without getting into the whole story, you can go Google this for yourself, okay, what the Hawthorne effect is. Basically, at the end of the day, it's determined that when you pay attention to people, the productivity goes up, but it's always short-term productivity. What he was basically saying to me, I want to make sure that what we learn will have stickiness, that after you're done training us, we're going to continue to be able to harness it, that it's not going to be a short-term productivity gain. So my entire presentation shifted around how I do what I do to ensure that what I taught them would last amongst the people there through some ongoing coaching and reinforcement. That, con that, got, that contract with this company, I've been doing this for 12 years with them now. Our relationship is tighter than ever. So the point is, Ask the penetrating question, but then shut up and listen to their answer because they're going to give you whatever the big idea. The big idea at Hewlett Packard was 
no more bumping of cargo. He didn't explicitly ask for it. I had to listen for it. The big idea at MTI College was they wanted more than the Hawthorne. In fact, we want more than just a productivity gain because we understand that training will give you a short-term result unless it's done in such fashion that people can harness it and use it forever. That's what he was saying. And your customers are constantly telling you the non-negotiable. But you got to learn how to ask the question that causes it to come out of them and you got to listen to it because when you listen to it, if selling is expressing your ideas from somebody else's perspective, you can't do that if you haven't heard it first. Ask the question, they'll give you the perspective and now you can dovetail what you do to the specific outcome they have just told you thereafter. So the question is, how are you listening? Listen, you listen with curiosity. You listen with insatiable curiosity. You shut up. You don't interrupt. Now, there's a whole training piece on, on, on the art and science of active listening, but we're terrible listeners by nature because we're constantly calculating, well, how do I Stop it. Just stop it. Listen. All right, so you want to be more successful in your respective businesses and practices as coaches, consultants, or whatever it is else you're doing. Ditch the pitch. Ditch the pitch and double your sales because the power in selling isn't in telling. The power in selling is in asking, listening, and confirming what you understand to be true. And that's the foundation of a deep and lasting trust. Listen, you are the sale. You're the one that creates value. You are the conduit between the customer and the product and service and the company that you represent. You yourself are the core differentiator. And this is how you get this, you know, indispensable. So, hey, Sean, I just, I want to finish with that, with that clip that I read from that book on George's call. I want to do that here too, because it just, it just yeah. brings it all together. Yeah, absolutely. Three minutes. All right. So yeah. I'm going to show you a book. This, this is a great groundbreaking book. It's, book is probably 17 years old now, but it, it, it's, it's every bit as relevant today as it ever was before. Now, this is really you know, directed toward professional sales teams, but there's lessons in here for everybody. But I want to read you one thing because it brings together everything that we just talked about. Okay. So this is a chapter from inside this book, Achieve Sales Excellence by Howard Stevens with a V, Stevens with a V. All right. It's, and it's, it, the, the chapter title is You Must Bring Us Applications. So let me just, let me just read this to you. It's unusual to find a salesperson profiled in a business magazine. It's much rarer to find such a profile in the New Yorker a literary magazine covering contemporary culture. Then one of its writers, James Stewart, went to Steinway Hall, the venerable piano maker's flagship showroom in Manhattan, and met Erica Feidner, who in 2001 had been Steinway & Sons' top salesperson for six years running. Uh, where am I? Six years for, for six years running, yeah. She sold $4 million worth of pianos in 1999 alone, $4 million of pianos in one year. Her success, okay, her, Feidner's success derived from her ability to match potential buyers to the right pianos. Her profile, her New Yorker profile, Matchmaker, opens with a description of how after a discussion with a brand new customer, Feidner writes a number on a slip of paper. She then leads the customer through the 300 odd pianos on display, the largest inventory of Steinways anywhere in the world. The customer plays more than a dozen, but is unable to find the one that is exactly right. Feidner mentions that there's a new arrival which is in the warehouse but has not been brought out to the floor yet. So she has it brought to the floor. The piano was brought out and while playing it, the customer quickly realizes it's perfect. Feidner produces the piece of paper on which she had written the number earlier in the day. The number matches exactly the serial number of the piano the customer just decided to buy. Magic? Well, it certainly feels that way to uh, many of the customers who purposely seek out Feidner when they want to shop for a Steinway. But as James Stewart delves further into her methods, there's that word again, method, 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 method. There's nothing random about this. As Steinway delves, as, as Stewart delves into her method, another picture emerges. For instance, at the beginning of a sale, Feidner habitually spends an hour or more chatting with the customer, not about the heritage, not about the quality, not about the options, not about about the models, not about anything about Steinway pianos, but another level, but she asks questions about the customer's level of play, their playing style, their taste in music, where and how often the customer will play the piano, what he or she will play on it, and what kind of response action and tone the customer expects. So here's what happens. Everything that I just talked about, here's what happened. Customer walks into a showroom, Feidner comes out, greets him, hey, welcome to Steinway, I'm just here to help you through all of this. I, Let's have a little chat. Okay, great. So listen, if you decide to buy a Steinway, you know, what, if, if, what, what room would it go into? What are the acoustics like? What kind of music do you like? 
listen, when you're, when you're playing a piano, do you like the keys to be a little more firm or do you like them to be a little more soft? Do you want a deep resonant tone or do you something want a little more sparkle up top? Talking about what the customer has envisioned in their mind, getting the customer to paint a vision of the outcome they're after, and then selling the thing after the fact becomes very easy. And I am suggesting the same will be true for you. If you'll learn how to open with thought provoking questions, build deep levels of trust, indispensable, uncommoditized, as my friend Yoda would say, indispensable, you will be. All right. So anyway, that's it. My name is Howard Olson. I hope you got something useful and of value here. And uh, listen, I'm, I'm wide open to Q&A. Awesome. Excellent. Thanks, Howard. Do you want to just take your screen off and then we can see people a little bit better? You bet. Be awesome. Um, all right. What are your questions, you guys? Because he just gave you so much freaking stuff. We're going to start with Sabrina. Go ahead. By the way, I'm, we're going to keep answering questions. At nine o'clock, we're officially over to drop off. <clears throat> um, but Howard, before we drop off and before they start questions. Yeah. Because the next 10 minutes is, is officially what we've got. Okay. Give me a bit more information about the Academy because we just really haven't had a chance to talk. You haven't really told me much about it. And I've got a whole sales team that I'm training and you know, yeah. that, that is a possibility for the team. Well, like, so I, like I said, I'm shifting everything online. So I, I'm, I'm, cre I've, I'm actually in the midst of building the high output sales and leadership communications ac academy yeah. where I'm taking all of the content that I've been doing live with customers. And uh, I'm going to be doing two things. I'm, I'm filming all of it, putting it into a virtual ready learning management system so people can come and, and learn at their own pace. But in conjunction with that, I'm going to be taking groups of 12 at a time through this flagship program called, you know, the, the, the sales success formula, the sales blueprint sales success formula. And so we're going to be, we're going to be slow dripping this. So the Academy is going to be a complete collection of everything from crafting your message to the, to the, to, to just better sales engagement process. Uh, mm -hmm. It's in launch phase right now. So I, by the, by the weekend, I'll actually have that up and running. So I'm, I'm actually offering a founders program. Anybody who wants to participate in this can literally buy lifetime access to all the content that's in there now and all the content that will come in the future. And I will personally handhold it. I'll be personally teaching it. And so two things. Uh, groups of 12 coming through on an enrollment basis, so 12 at a time. Come on, let's go through this, build community. And then within the platform itself, I'm taking everything off of Facebook and everything off of, off of Slack and building user forums so that we can actually peer-to-peer -peer mentor and coach each other. And this will give me the ability. So as we learn this, basically we can share best practices with each other and I can mm. I can – I can group coach one to many moderating this whole thing. And if anybody needs personal coaching, of course, I'll offer all of that as well. And so I'll teach it on week one, week one, you get lesson one, and then all the archives will be there. So you can go back and re and, 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 and continue to review and refresh yourself on that. And then as Which the forum that people aren't doing is kind of crazy because nothing I learned, I only learned once. I probably yeah. learned everything I learned about 28 times. Yeah, it's, it's repetitive. I mean, everything, everything is habit forming. And so I've taken, basically, I've, I've, got, I've got a couple of large corporate clients. And when this whole COVID thing came, I took two of them and I beta tested. I said, listen, the way that I teach this live in the classroom where I can see you, shake hands with you and physically interact with you, teaching it online is going to be different. I, I think I know how to do it. Let me beta test this on you. So I've actually taken this through three, cor two corporate entities now. I've got, I've got all the kinks worked out and I'm, I'm right. going to start launch. July 1st is basically launch day, but I'm going to, I'll be taking pre-sales on it. Anybody who wants to participate in this, $695 will get you lifetime access to everything that happens in that academy. It's going to be normally a $3,500 a year subscription. So $695 provides lifetime access? Lifetime access. Now that doesn't get you. So if you need additional coaching and stuff like that, you get preferential rates on that, but you get lifetime access to all the videos and I'll personally walk you through the flagship program. That's insane. Well, that, there's You're a reason welcome. why I'm doing it. I am a little crazy. Oh my Listen, God. David, you but I really, I, I really mean when I say I, I really have a heart to help the small business person that, that is struggling when they don't need to just because nobody's ever shared this with them. So yeah, 695, was well, 697, I guess call it 697 lifetime access to what's in there. I'll personally, so I'm probably going to have to do a couple intakes, you know, cause I'm not going to take more than 12 at a time. So basically we'll, we'll, we'll do the first run on Tuesdays, let's say from 10 to noon uh, for six weeks, two hours every Tuesday until that's done. And then all the video archives plus whatever comes after that. And if there's, you know, then there's going to be, you know, so anyway, we're going to get into personality profiling and understanding your, your communication strengths and weaknesses. Howard, that is absolutely amazing. So, so my gift is like providing people brand creative ways of saying things, what they do. So you just gave yep. me the IRA of sales and just thank you. Wow. Thank you very You're much very for welcome. that.